Welcome to Crocker Art Museum. My name is Ying Sang Man, and I am joined by Mallory Marsh. Say hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ying Sang. She'll be off camera most of the time, but she'll be helping me monitor your comments. If you have any, feel free to type those into the chat box. Today, we're here in the early California gallery. And behind me is a painting called Chinese Restaurant. Now you may be wondering why is a restaurant, Chinese restaurant, in the early California gallery? Well the answer is this is not in China. This is actually in San Francisco, California. So it's very appropriate here. This is painted not by a Chinese artist, but actually by a German-American called Theodore Juarez. And he did this in 1884. Now, this is an unusual time to be painting Chinese people because there was a lot of hostility towards Chinese people at the time. There's an example of how a typical depiction of Chinese looked like. You'll see that Chinese were considered pests, like bats. And so a negative image was what people had of Chinese people. So how did a German-American come to paint Chinese people in such a humane way? Well, the answer is he grew up near Chinatown. He had to walk through Chinatown every day to get to school. So he got to know them as real people and not as caricatures. Now, when you say Chinatown, you're talking about San Francisco, right? San Francisco. And that's still there today? It is. Yes, it is. I wonder, anyone at home, if you've been to Chinatown or ever want to go there, let us know in the chat. Exactly. The way Juarez painted this painting is very skillful. Can you tell us what colors he used predominantly? Any ideas? I know when I look at it, I see a lot of gold. The mm -hmm. purple wall certainly helps, but I see a lot of gold. Mm -hmm. I wonder for any of our friends at home, let us know in the chat what colors you see in the piece or maybe how you would describe the colors that you see. Now I know Ying saying you're a lot closer than I am. I know there's some really bright little bits of red in there. Can you point out where you see those? Oh yes, the red here on the hat and on the boy's hat. There's some muted red also on the screen in the background and also on the edges here. And red is a very important color in Chinese culture. It symbolizes happiness and good luck. And so people wear red on festivals, at weddings, the brides will wear red at their wedding. Another predominant color is yellow and gold. And gold represents the earth. It also represents the emperor. So you can see this sumptuous look that Theodore War has managed to capture. Uh, our friends in the chat have some adjectives for describing the colors they see. Mm -hmm. They're saying rich and deep, yes. also cool. Mm -hmm. Cool as in the popular sense or cool as in cold? Well, as art enthusiasts, right, we know that cool colors has the, the populist meaning, like, wow, that's cool, but it also yes. has a, a meaning in art terms. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, predominantly the colors here, red and yellows, and a little bit of the muted green and, and the soft black, those are what we call warm colors. The blue is a little bit on the cool side, but there's such a small amount of it here, it doesn't mm -hmm. take away from the painting. And I liked that the artist used these colors in order to exude warmth to the audience. It does feel very warm standing in front of it. And I, you, you said yellow, I'm, gonna, I'm calling it gold, but really kind of in the middle of the piece, there's a very glowing kind of aspect to it. And then I sort of see it 
on the faces of the men that we see. My eyes are really drawn to them because it's so bright mm -hmm. and kind of shiny. Mm. White is also a good color to draw the eye. And so our eyes are drawn towards the center of the picture to where the action is happening, to where the figures are. Yeah, I even see the two white lanterns coming down to the white tablecloth. Yeah, and that sort of draws the eye downwards also. And something else that draws the eye downwards is the vertical lines. You see it in the paintings in the background. You see it in the door frame here. And also in the screen in the back. And that brings the eye from the sumptuousness up, up the top to the setting down below. I love the way you talked about the lines in this piece because I didn't see them when I first looked at it. I got more of like a sense of the space and the architecture, but when you drew my attention to lines, all of a sudden now I see them everywhere. I see a lot of verticals like you described. I see curved lines. You mentioned that screen in the back. I know you've got a good view of the, of the object. Can you describe that screen in the back for us? Well, the, it's a wooden screen. It's probably lacquer, which is a type of Chinese artifact. There's some glass window, leaded glass window mm -hmm. in the back or embedded. And there's some wording in there. Those are Chinese handwriting, not handwriting, but writing. And I was really surprised when I saw that at first because a lot of times Western artists will just show Chinese writing as just random slashes. Mm. And here, he was very, very accurate in depicting Chinese writing, which as you can see is read from top to bottom. So I really commend this artist in his accuracy in that. I like that you started to zero in on some of the details in the background. For our friends at home, if you have any questions about any areas or details you want us to discuss, just drop it in the chat and we'll check it and um, let you know a little bit about what you're seeing. So some other details that I picked up on in this painting are the two, I believe it's two instruments that are included. Oh yes. In the background here, we see a man playing an instrument. It is called Erhu, E-R-H-U. And that basically means two-stringed instrument because that's all it has is two strings. Now, for all of Warriors' accuracy, this is where I believe he got it wrong. We're all allowed one, right? <laughs> just, <laughs> just this one little time because the Erhu is actually played upright and with a bow. And you can see here is another arhu with the bow hanging with it. So he knew it was supposed to be played with a bow, but he chose to depict it this way. The arhu was an ancient instrument. It dates back, I believe, to the 10th century. Oh, wow. And it has become the leading instrument of Chinese orchestras nowadays. Still now. Yes, mm -hmm. it's a um, very haunting sound if you ever get a chance to hear it. The other instrument is this lute-like instrument called a pipa. Pipa is Chinese for forward plucking and backward plucking. Pi forward, pa backwards. And unlike the arhu, this originally was played sideways like a guitar because the instrument actually didn't come from China. It did not originate in China. It came to China via the Silk Road and the Chinese, there are some ancient paintings that show the Chinese playing sideways, but then over the years it just evolved and now the pipa is played vertically and with the forward and backward plucking with the fingers. Oh, I love that you touched on that. One of our friends in the chat was asking, how do you play the instrument? Can you give us a sense with just your hands how big these instruments are? Uh, 
there is a traveling size pipa that's about this big, I believe, and then the regular one is pretty big. So somewhere to like a regular to large size violin. Um, the small one, mm -hmm. yes, like a violin. The larger one, probably closer to a guitar. Mm -hmm. The ahu is uh, you sit it on the knee and mm -hmm. and hold it up, upright and, and play like this. And there's no fret on the there's no fingerboard to play. So it's a very difficult instrument to play. We have a question in the chat about the details of this piece. Like, like how does the artist make it look so detailed and three-dimensional? Oh, well, he does a really good job of placing things in the foreground, middle ground, and background. And he uses some clever techniques such as blurring in the background. You know, I noticed that the man in the very back playing the instrument seemed more blurry than the yes. people closer to me. And also a, a, the colors are muted, darker. So that's how you show depth. And what was the other question? I think you covered it, just the idea of how, how he gets, I'm curious about the details, the especially details. in what you call the foreground, because mm -hmm. it's such, it's like the paint is applied thicker also to get the, um, like the really clean lines. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that Warres said was he tried to do each painting, complete it in a day if he could. Oh, wow. He, he was very confident in his strokes. And so he did very, actually very little overpainting compared to some other artists. Now, is this oil paint? This is oil mm -hmm. paint, yes. Did anybody want to know about the food on the table? I would like to know about the <laughs> food on the table. <laughs> well, here we have a teacup with a lid on it. It doesn't look like a teacup that maybe your grandmother has in her china cabinet because it's a Chinese teacup and there's no handles. And the saying goes, if it's too hot to hold, then it's too hot to drink. So tea drinking has a very long tradition. It's been around in China since before the third century. And then around uh, 10th century or so, the tea houses began serving little snacks to go with the tea. But it really came to the fore in the 1800s when they started making more and more and more different types of little dishes and they called it dim sum. A light touch of the heart is the translation for dim sum. So I recommend you try that out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of our viewers is asking, what is that black thing? <laughs> Which I think is um, challenging. Maybe if we're looking at the food on the table, it does look like a dark spot kind of in the middle. Yeah, yeah let's, um, let's go with that. Can you tell what that is? That, as far as I can tell, looks like black sesame roll. Hmm. And it's actually pretty easy to make, so I've been told. <laughs> it's just simple ingredients like black sesame seed, cornstarch, arrowroot flour, water, sugar, and you mix that all up. Um, you, it, it pours out, and then you steam that s circular disc, and when it's done, it's like jelly and you roll that up and then you cut it into bite-sized pieces. Hmm. And it's a, a sweet dish. It's like a you, cake, yeah. Yeah, like a cake, almost like a Swiss roll. We haven't seen very much of that lately because I think foods just have trends. They come and go. I remember seeing this black sesame roll about 30 years ago. Mm. Oh, no, I'm showing my age. <laughs> <laughs> and I miss it. Hopefully it'll come back. 
Well, maybe well, somebody can make it. I was going to say, it sounds like you have an understanding of maybe how to make it. <laughs> maybe you might have to take that one on. We have a question in the chat. Does the Crocker have other paintings by this artist? Yes, the Crocker has a painting in the, I believe it's the Impressionistic Gallery. Now we're lucky because we're here. We just walked next door to look <laughs> at it. <laughs> but yes, heading, to, heading towards Impressionism. Yes, so Theodore Warriors was one of the first Western painters to go to Japan and live and study there. And he learned a lot from their style of painting. And so he's done a number of pieces that look very Japanese. And those are beautiful too. Yeah, because the one we have in the room next door does have irises and the clothing mm -hmm. on the figures. Yes, looks the very commandos. Japanese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also have a question about the hats. Why do the people have on hats? Oh, ah, well that goes along with the hairstyle. So you'll notice the pigtail in the back. The Chinese had that unique style of hairstyle from the 16, mid 1600s, 1645 to be exact. Before that date, the Chinese considered their hair to be sacred and mm. it wasn't to be cut. But then the Manchus invaded and took over China and their hair was done in this way where they shaved the front part and then they braided the back. And they demanded that all men in China follow that same hairstyle. And people protested saying, but our hair is sacred, we couldn't do that. Well, they were told, well, you can either keep the hair and cut the head off, or you can keep your head and cut the hair. So they really had no choice. And so they carried on this style of, of doing hair up until the early 1900s when the Manchu reign finally came to an end. So we saw that influence even here in the United States. Yes, a lot of the men that came over to the United States, and it was mostly men because of the various racist laws that were in place in the United States, a majority of them had, in, had all good intentions of returning to China. Hmm. So that's why they kept their hairstyle. And you and I were chatting a little bit before we started about the impact that the Chinese immigrants had on the state. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and maybe help put the painting in some context? Yes, the majority of the early Chinese came in the 1850s. That was when the gold rush was on. So, so about 30 years before this. About 30 years mm -hmm. before this. And when that ran out, they ended up working on the railroad, and at the time, there were two sections, two main sections of the railroad from east coast to west coast. And not many people know that the Central Pacific Railroad portion, that was composed of about 90% of Chinese laborers and that was because they were really good workers. And so the railroad company hired more and more and more, and even went to China to recruit laborers to work on the railroad. And then after that, they worked on draining the swamps, building levees. Some of them became domestic servants. Others opened up businesses like laundries and grocery stores and restaurants, of course. And you know, the oldest Chinese restaurant from that time period still is open today. It's called Canton Restaurant in San Francisco. And is it in Chinatown? In Chinatown. Mm -hmm. And it was opened in 1849. Wow. Yeah, long history. We have um, a question in the chat that I think relates to what I was going to ask too. So 
the person in the chat is saying, why is there only one person not wearing a hat? And it, it kind of makes me wonder, who are these people we see in the painting? Are they, how are they related to the history you just described? And we are getting into territory where we're kind of using our imagination and guessing a little bit. I would guess that the man in green, because green represents wealth and purity at the same time, I would guess he is the businessman because he has the different clothing, he has a little red dot on his hat, mm -hmm. it's hard to tell from maybe your angle, but he looks like he may be the wealthy businessman and he is giving a treat to the little boy. The person off to the side obviously is a waiter and it's hard to tell who these other people are. Perhaps those are employees of the businessman. But it's all just guesswork on my part. Now this next question might be guesswork or you might know. Mm -hmm. But someone's asking, did the artist paint this um, before or after China built the Great Wall? Oh, well, the Great Wall was built many, many, many years ago. Uh, it, the Great Wall was begun about the turn of the millennium. And then uh, it was really extended in about the 10th century when the Mongols were starting to come south and maraud all of China and Asia and then onto Europe. So the, the Great Wall was built before, way before this painting Hundreds was Hundreds <laughs> of years. Yes. And then um, we have one more question that I think might be a good one to go out on, okay. is why did the artist paint this picture? That is a really good question. You would think that he might jump on the bandwagon and paint Chinese people as marauders and pests and <laughs> not very nice people. But I'm guessing that since he got to know people, the Chinese people well, and he actually opened up a studio on the edge of Chinatown and he taught Chinese students to paint Western art. So I think he wanted to show, hey, there's a different side to Chinese people that maybe people haven't seen before. All right, we got one more question. Okay. That always comes up on a tour. Yeah? How much is this painting worth? Oh my goodness. I know. <laughs> did you come across, so maybe I'll I reframe no that. In your research, did you come across any of his other work that had sold? I, to be frank, I never even looked mm -hmm. at the price because to me, it's priceless. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you said that. What I was thinking when you said that was we are so lucky to have it here in the museum and have access to it and be able to learn from it and learn about it in history and then also in the context of today. Absolutely. Is there anything else you want to add about this piece? I just love it. <laughs> yeah, that's a great thing to go out on. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Ying Sang, for sharing all of this with us today. I want to thank, thank our friends at home um, for, for joining us, for uh, chatting with us, and for learning more about this Chinese restaurant painting. If you liked the program, you can come back in another two weeks. We'll be in another gallery with another guest looking at another work of art. Thanks, everybody.
Welcome to Crocker Art Museum. My name is Ying Sang Nam. I am joined by Mallory Marsh. And she'll be in the background. Say hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Ying Sang. <laughs> she'll be helping me monitor any comments or field any questions you, that you might have. So feel free to put those in the chat box. Well, we're here today in the early California gallery. And I'm standing in front of a painting called Chinese Restaurant. Now that seems a little odd for California until you remember how important the Chinese were in California history. So I can talk a little bit about how the Chinese came for the gold rush in the 1850s and then they stayed to work on building the railroad. Now not many people know that 90% of the laborers building the Central Pacific Railroad were actually Chinese. And then, of course, after that was complete, people started businesses such as laundries, grocery stores, Chinese restaurants, and that brings us to here. So obviously, this restaurant was painted in San Francisco. The date 1884 is unusual to me. That's what caught my eye when I saw this painting. Because right around this time was a very hostile time for Chinese people. And that led to the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which that kept out Chinese people for more than half a century. So with that hostility and in the newspapers, what you would see were these grotesque caricatures of the Chinese. And we have one to show right here. They're seen as pests and marauders and not quite human. So when we look at this painting, it's a complete different picture. So I'd like to invite you to take a look yourself and tell me what thoughts you have on it. Let's take, I really like taking some slow, quiet time just to look. Let's spend a little time looking for our viewers at home. If you have any questions about the piece or about any details that you see, just let us know in the comment section and we'll direct our attention there. As I look at this piece, I really like to move my eye from top to bottom because it really seems to be kind of divided in that way. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And probably the reason that your eye is moving from top to bottom is because the artist is very skillful in the use of his lines. So you start at the top because you've got this bright white in the middle there that draws your eye towards it. And then you have these lines that draw you down. And also this white triangle just draws your eye down towards the center of the action. I love that you, you've already used three elements in describing this. You mentioned the white, the color, you mentioned lines, and then you mentioned like a triangle drawing our eye down. I would love for our viewers at home to give us some descriptive words. How would you describe the lines, shapes, or colors that you see? How would you describe the lines, Yang Sang? Well, the vertical, there's some swirls to add interest. Um, the lines are very appropriate. The vertical lines are very appropriate to the Chinese culture mm. since writing is done from top to bottom. And also you see the wall paintings in the back. Those are done on scrolls. And scrolls were hung up usually in sets of four to show seasons. Hmm. This looks to me, now that you're drawing my attention to the architecture of the space, it looks like a very elaborate, fancy place. Hmm. 
Yes. Uh, the gold is very important to show opulence and also the warmth of the colors. The reds and the golds show the warmth and that imbues it onto the audience. Yeah, this painting has like a lot of dimension to me. There's a lot of layering. And I mm. think part of that is the way that he's applied the paint or like the viscosity of the paint and the objects that are closest to me that stand out in the most detail are really thickly applied and really bright, brightly colored. He's very skillful in his use of color and making the, the colors just pop in front and sort of become muted in the background. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we get a good sense of foreground, middle ground, and background. Now you mentioned, when you were talking about lines, you mentioned the scrolls mm -hmm. that I see on the left, but I also see some vertical lines and some paneling on the right. Can you tell me more about that? Oh, yes. So the screen back here has glass embedded into it, and in the glass is some Chinese writing. And that's something that astonished me about this painter. He's a Western painter, and yet he was able to very accurately depict Chinese writing. So I am surprised by that because normally I see Western painters do Chinese writing as a series of random slashes. Like approximating it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he really paid attention to detail, and I appreciate that. So that's a good segue into us learning a little bit about the artist. Well, given all of the caricatures in the newspapers that show Chinese people as being less than human, how do you think somebody might paint Chinese people as regular human beings? Well, there's a simple answer to that, and that is he grew up near Chinatown. His parents had a shop nearby, and he had to walk through Chinatown every day to get to school. So he got to know them as real people. And then later on, after he finished art school, he opened up a studio right on the edge of Chinatown, and his students were Chinese people who came in to learn the art of Western painting. So again, knowing, getting to know these people really makes one's perspective change. Mm -hmm. And so for him, in choosing to paint this particular scene, it might be accurate to say it would have been a scene out of his, maybe not every day, but kind of everyday life because of where he was living? I believe so. He actually had an assistant who was a Chinese person. So he probably would have been invited to a restaurant like this and seen such a depiction and decided to paint that. Now we know the title of the piece is Chinese Restaurant. We've been talking about it as a restaurant. So we do see some food on the table. Can you tell us a little bit about the food? Yes. This food is called dim sum and it starts with tea. It always starts with tea. In fact, in the Cantonese language, they actually hardly ever say dim sum. They say yum cha, which means to drink tea. Mm. And so right in the center, we see a teacup with a saucer and a lid on it. Now notice that there's no handles on the teacup because the saying goes, if a cup is too hot, to handle, it's too hot to drink. Tea drinking has been around in the Chinese culture since before the third century. And around the 10th century, Cantonese tea houses started to include little snacks to go with their tea. But it just burst forth in the 1800s. In Canton and in San Francisco, 
where they made more and more and more exquisite and delicate little pastries and dishes. And so now you have about a thousand variety of different dishes. Oh, wow. But not all of them are current because food comes in and goes, the, the trends. Uh, one of the things that has disappeared, sadly, is in the middle of the table, the little, little black things there, those are black sesame rolls. And those were real popular about 30 years ago. So you don't see that now. But basically what that is, is um, black sesame, cornstarch, arrowroot flour, sugar, water, and you'd pour the mix onto a pan, into a circle, steam that, and when that's done, it's like a jelly. And you roll that up and cut them into bits, bite-sized pieces. And it's a, a, a nice light dessert. But I bet you can make it at home if you look it up on a food mm -hmm. <laughs> recipe. Right, that's the great it's thing a, about the internet. Yes, we can look everything there. <laughs> So the, the food and the waiter make me think restaurant, mm -hmm. but there are some objects or details in the painting that I maybe wouldn't expect to see in a restaurant. Um, yeah, are you thinking about the musical instruments? I am, yeah, I'm curious okay. about that. All right, well, the man in the back is playing the Erhu, E-R-H-U, and that is a two-stringed instrument that some people have called the Chinese violin. Of all the accuracies that I see this painter paint this in, that is the one thing that I believe he got it wrong. Well, I was gonna say, it doesn't look like a violin to me because of the way he's holding it. He's holding it sideways a little like a guitar and he's using his fingers to pluck. If you look at another Erhu that's hanging on the wall over here, you'll see that there is a bow. The Erhu is always played, almost always played with a bow, like 99.999% of the time played with a bow. But always, 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 100% of the time, it's played upright. It never has been played hmm. sideways. The other instrument, on the other hand, is the pipa, and that's Chinese for forward plucking and backward plucking. P, forward, pa, backward. And that was an instrument that did not originate in China. It came from Persia along the Silk Road to China in about uh, tenth, seventh to tenth dynasty, uh, seventh to tenth centuries, the Tang Dynasty. And that one was originally played sideways like a guitar, but over the years it just evolved to be played upright. I've pointed out some of the details that I wondered about or found striking in this work. Are there any that you are interested in that we haven't talked about yet? Well, we can talk about the paintings in the back. In Chinese painting, traditional Chinese painting, uh, paint was applied on silk, and you could mount it either on a horizontal roll or on a vertical roll. The horizontal ones were pulled out and read like a story, bit by bit and you did it all in one sitting and you rolled it back up and put it away. It was not displayed. The vertical ones were displayed on a temporary basis and rotated out according to the season or the occasion. And the reason for that is the incredibly fragile nature of the inks and the silks. If you expose that to too much sunlight, it would just fade and deteriorate. Which is something we're aware of even now here at the museum. Mm -hmm. 
You may have noticed the hair. This man has a braid in back, and you can't see the other gentleman. They also have braids in the back. Another one of those vertical lines you were oh, yes, talking exactly. about. Yeah. And that hairstyle has been around since 1645. Before that date, men, women, considered their hair sacred, and so they would never cut it. They just coiled it up. The men would coil it up into a top knot. The women had fantastic hairdos. I wish I had a picture to show you, but you may want to look that up. Beautiful hair styles that they used because they had really long hair. But in 1644, the Manchus came and invaded China. They came from the north, from Manchuria into China and took over and they demanded that the men show their allegiance to the new emperor by adopting the Manchu hairstyle, which was to shave the front part of the head and braid the back. And if anybody protested and said, but I can't, this, this is sacred to me, then they had the option, either keep the head and cut the hair or cut the hair and keep the head. Not much of an option. So that tradition has passed down and continued through the 1800s into the early 1900s when the Manchu Empire ended. And the Chinese men who came over to the United States in the 1800s, they kept that, this hairstyle because they had good intention of returning to China. And that was primarily because it was very, very hard for Chinese women to enter the United States. Um, and so that's why men who came over, they had left wives behind, family behind. So it's unusual even to see a child in this painting. Can you tell us a little bit about why they immigrated here? Well, Back in the 1700s, Chinese goods were in high demand in the West. And so really the very, very first people that came from China were merchants. But there were actually very few of them. Still, that was when we first see evidence of Chinese people on California soil. Uh, they came over on Spanish ships before California it was even a part of America. But then in the 1850s, there was in China a um, famine, a flood, a civil war, two opium wars, and that made life incredibly hard for the Chinese. And they ended up leaving China, spreading out all over the world, but mostly because of various treaties, they ended up in California. And in 1850s, that was when we had the gold rush. Everybody was coming to California then, including the Chinese. In the 1860s, when pretty much the, the gold rush had died down, the Chinese men offered up services as laborers on the railroad. And at first, people looked at them, oh, those scrawny guys, huh? <laughs> what can they do? But in fact, they surprised everybody with their hard work and their bravery because they took on the, the hardest jobs mm -hmm. and the most dangerous ones, like dynamiting um, and working off the sides of cliffs. And so the railroad barons hired more and more of them so that by the end of it, like 90% of the laborers of the Central Pacific Railroad were Chinese. And, so and a lot of that's still the same track that we see today. Yes, the, that's still here today. So this painting was made about 20 or so years after that. 
I think a good question to go out on is, why do you think the artist painted this picture? Well, um, in 1882, you had the Exclusion Act, which prevented Chinese from entering the United States. And you had the, these really ugly depictions of what Chinese people were like. And I think that Juarez wanted to show a different side of Chinese, the side that he knew, respectable human beings. That's my belief. Is there anything else you want to leave us with as we spend our last few moments with the painting? I just think that it's a very important part of California history. And I think that it, it's an important part of present day history to realize that we just need to get to know people in order to see them for real human beings as they are. Well, I want to thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. You know, it, it's easy standing here in this space to be overwhelmed by all of the paintings that we see and all these gold frames and just all this stuff. So I'm really grateful that we had some time together this afternoon to really zero in on this piece in particular. And I want to say thank you for sharing everything you know with me and with the people at home. Thank you. Thanks everyone at home for tuning in. We'll be back uh, next month with another piece live streamed from the galleries. We'll see you then.
Welcome to Crocker Art Museum. My name is Ying Sang Man. I am joined by Mallory Marsh, and she's going to help me with fielding comments and questions. So feel free to put those in the chat. Say hi to Mallory. Hi, everybody. Hi, Ying Sang. Yes, thank you for mentioning the chat. We'll be monitoring the comment section, looking for your questions and observations from home. Well, we're here in the early California gallery, and we're standing in front of a painting called Chinese Restaurant. Now, this is not Chinese Restaurant in China, but Chinese Restaurant in San Francisco. This painting was done by an artist named Theodore Juarez. He was a German-American. And you may be thinking, why is a German-American painting such a scene? Let me take you back a little bit to the times. So this is 1884 is when he painted this. Around 1870s, 1880s, there was a lot of hostility towards the Chinese. And in the newspapers, there was this rallying cry of the Chinese must go, Chinese must go. And the, accompanying those hostile pieces, were caricatures such as the one that's being shown on your screen where not just pushing the Chinese people out but actually harming them. And there was all sorts of legislation that passed to make life difficult for the Chinese including race-based taxes, um, prohibiting Chinese men from marrying white women and also prohibiting them from testifying in court. And furthermore, in 1878, that was when it was ruled that Chinese people couldn't even become citizens of the United States. Which brings us to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And that act prohibited Chinese people from entering the United States for what ended up to be more than 50 years. And then in 1884, we have this painting. So really within two years of that act passing, exactly. very recent time. Yes. So that act seemed to legitimize the acts of hostilities even more and none of it was rhetorical. There were massacres in LA, in Rock Springs, Wyoming, Hell's Canyon, Idaho, where countless lives were lost and properties destroyed, and nobody was held accountable for any of that. And I believe that uh, Theodore Juarez painted this scene just as a counter to all of that hostility that was going on. So let's take a closer look at this. What do you notice about, let's say, the colors? I love that you're asking about the colors to start because it kind of really zeroes us in on the piece itself. I see, I see a lot of gold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, the purple wall helps really <laughs> accentuate it and that frame, but I, I see a lot of gold and yellow. I wonder for the people at home, what colors do you see? Can you put in the chat maybe some descriptive words for those colors? I'm trying to think how I would, I would maybe describe the gold in two different ways. In some ways where that like architectural detailing is, it's super vibrant and bright and um, really intense in its color, but then there's other areas in the painting when it's more muted and subtle. Well, gold is a very important color, or yellow is a very important color in Chinese culture. Gold is related to the emperor, so gold has a, a very royal tone to it. And also red, especially red, is a very important color in Chinese culture. It's the symbol of good luck and, and fire. And so 
people will wear red at festivals and brides will wear red on their wedding day. So that's very appropriate for this painting is to have the reds and the golds. The other color that's important in Chinese culture is the green. You'll notice the man in the middle is wearing green. That probably symbolizes that he is a businessman because green represents wealth. It also represents purity. And I don't know if you'll notice the bamboo in the corner here. Yeah, the color helps draw my eye there. There's, yeah. there's a lot of balance and kind of symmetry in this piece. Mm -hmm. And that green helps draw my eye there. Well, bamboo is a very important part of Chinese culture too. Bamboo, if you've ever tried to get rid of a bamboo in your yard, which I had tried and failed, <laughs> you'll know that bamboo is very, very tough. And so it represents steadfastness and tenacity. There are other important symbolisms in this painting. You'll notice a lot of circles mm -hmm. as well as squares. Circles represent heaven and squares represent the earth. So it is important to have a balance of both in a painting. Did you want to talk about the lines or did you want me to talk about the lines? Yeah, let's talk about the lines. <laughs> <laughs> in a lot of genre paintings around here in this gallery, they tend to be horizontal. This one is one of the few ones that uh, is vertical and you'll see the vertical lines echoed in the painting and that echoing reflects the paintings, the Chinese paintings that are generally done on vertical rolls, scrolls. Also the writing, Chinese writing is read from top to bottom. And so you have those lines going down. But also what's important with this artist is he is drawing our eye down. He's spotlighting the elaborate architecture up above, and then drawing our eyes down to the action. Dangling. Yeah, the people are almost framed within the frame because of the architecture that's included. Yeah, it almost looks like they're on a stage, doesn't it? You mentioned the vertical lines in the background. There's mm -hmm. some on the left and then some on the right. Can you tell us a little bit about the ones we see on the right? Oh, the writing. Uh, that is glass embedded on a screen. Screens were very important in the Chinese households, wealthier households, because they had bigger rooms and they were able to make smaller rooms with the screens. This is a very nice example of a wooden screen with beautiful, beautifully done Chinese writing in the middle of it. That's something I, I really appreciate this artist for because usually Western painters will depict Chinese writing as random slashes. And here he's taken the time to study the writing and portray it in a very accurate way. So that kind of signaled to you as you moved through this gallery um, to maybe pay attention a little more that the artist might have a different kind of relationship or intention in making a piece like this. He was very respectful towards the Chinese people. And you may want, wonder why would a German American feel that way towards Chinese people when all around him, you know, people were depicting the Chinese as pests and, and marauders. Well, he, grew up near Chinatown. His family had a store about a block away. He actually had to walk through Chinatown to get to school every day. And then after art school, he opened up a studio right on the edge of Chinatown and he actually had Chinese students 
study under him, the practice of Western painting. So he was depicting to him what might have been a nearly everyday scene, or at least in his immediate everyday environment. Absolutely. He's done other paintings on Chinese people as well. The fishmonger is one of them, uh, Chinese musicians, which is astonishing to me because of the amount of Chinese writing he had to do in that scene. So we see that writing in other paintings in of other his? In other paintings, mm -hmm. yes. We're going to continue to dive into the details of the piece. For anyone at home, if you have any questions about specific areas or things that you see, go ahead and add those in the chat, and then Ying Sang and I will be able to address those as we continue with our conversation. Now, you mentioned the artist doing other paintings, and specifically another painting with musicians. Is there anything musical that we find in this Chinese restaurant scene? Yes. Do you notice the man in the back holding an instrument? I love that you asked if I noticed him. I like the use of that word because we can see him because this is a really realistic, detailed painting, but he is less intense in color, he's kind of blurry, he's really very much in the background, but he's also, if we think of the piece structurally, pretty close to the center. So we do still see him, so yes, I noticed him, but I can't totally tell what he's doing. Can you tell me more about what he's doing? Well, he is literally playing background music. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he is holding an arhu. That's spelled E-R-H-U. It's a Chinese instrument that has two strings. Some people call it the Chinese violin. Other people call it the spike fiddle. And it is played, and this is where Warris got the one little tiny thing wrong in the painting. We'll allow him one. <laughs> we'll allow him, we'll give him a pass on that. It's always, always, always played upright. And almost always played with a bow. And you can actually see a bow hanging with another arhu on the wall, on the side. So this is a very difficult instrument to play because there's no fret for the fingering. But the music is very, very haunting. If you've ever watched Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, there's some of that awful music there. And is that an instrument that's still played today? Yes, it has been around a long time, uh, about from the third century, and it is considered the leading instrument in a Chinese orchestra nowadays. And there's one other instrument included, mm. right? Yes, on the side here is a pipa, P-I-P-A. That is Chinese for P is forward plucking and Pa is backwards plucking. And it's a four stringed instrument that did not originate in China. It came from Persia by way of the Silk Road. And in the very beginning, it was played like a guitar on its side. And you'll see ancient Chinese paintings showing that. But over time, it just evolved and Nowadays, the pipa is played upright. So moving my eyes around the painting, we talked about the architectural detail, some of what's happening in the background with the vertical lines and the figure playing the instruments. Are there any details that you can see or are drawn to that you know more about? Um, well, I, I'm always hungry, so I want to talk about the food. <laughs> well, it is a restaurant, right? It is a restaurant. Let's talk about exactly. the food. <laughs> Let's talk about it. This is a restaurant showing dim sum, and some of you may be familiar with that. It all started with tea. You'll see the teacup in the middle. Traditional Chinese teacups did not have handles. The saying goes, if it's too hot to hold, then it's too hot to drink. So you would keep it warm with the lid, you'd have your little saucer, 
that then you would hold it with both hands. And tea drinking has been around since before the third century. In the 10th century, Canton tea houses began serving little dishes of snacks to go with the tea. And then it really took off in the 1800s, both in Canton, China, as well as San Francisco. And now there are over a thousand varieties of different types of dishes that you can order. But there are trends. Obviously, one restaurant can't serve all of <laughs> a thousand <laughs> varieties. And one of the trends that have, has gone out is the black sesame roll, which you can see in the middle of the table there. Which I love that he included that as like a historical reference on food, but also as a really nice point of contrast to do the white tablecloth and then the black food item. Exactly. Can you tell me what that is? Uh, it's made from black sesame seed, arrowroot flour, cornstarch, water, and sugar. Just very simple recipe. You mix it together, pour it out into a, a circular mold and steam that. And it, it ends up looking like jelly. You would roll it up and then cut it into bite-sized pieces. I, I notice, I'm struck when I look at this piece for a longer period of time, really how balanced and strategic he was with the color. It really moves your eye around the piece and it's kind of fun to just think of one color and then allow, allow that one hue to bring your eyes all over. Looking at that black sesame roll, I then start to notice the really pigmented black that we see kind of in a middle band on that piece. So I see it in the clothing. It's really dominant in that chair. And then I see it in their hats and their hair. And then connecting that to this idea of vertical lines, I see a particular hairstyle on the man in green. Can you tell oh. us more about his hairstyle? Okay, so that is the pigtail, or some people call it the queue, which is uh, a French word for tail. And that hairstyle was a traditional Chinese hairstyle, but it hasn't been in ch Chinese culture for forever. It's only been since 1645, because the year before that, the Manchus invaded from Manchuria and they took over China. And they demanded that the, the Chinese men cut their hair. Before that time, the Chinese considered their hair to be sacred. They, did, they didn't touch their hair. It was coiled up into a top knot for men, uh, made into beautiful different hairstyles for women. They just didn't cut it. But when the Manchus came along, they said you need to shave the front part of your head and then braid the back. And if there was any protest, they were told you either keep the hair and we cut off your head or we cut your hair and then you can keep your head. So not much of a choice there. Yeah, not much of a choice. And then that tradition just continued over the centuries until the end of the Manchu reign, which was in the early 1900s. But those Chinese men that came over to the United States kept this hairstyle because a lot of them had all good intentions of returning to China because mostly they, they left wives and children behind. Um, Chinese, they made it really, really difficult for Chinese women to enter the United States. And then that 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act just stopped the Chinese from entering the United States. Can you talk more about maybe why they stayed here or what their role was in the state at that time? Well, they first came over in a large measure in the 1850s following famine, flood, uh, civil war, two opium wars, and it just drove out a lot of Chinese from China. And because of the 
treaties that the United States had with China, a lot of them ended up in the United States, in California. At an opportune time in the state of California. 1850s was the gold rush, 1860s was when you had the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. And not a whole lot of people know that the Central Pacific Railroad portion, that was made up of 90%, um, 90% of that, the laborers were made up of Chinese laborers. And that's the railroad that we still see around the state and country today. Yes, absolutely. And after that was completed, they stayed and took on various other jobs, training swamps, building levees, becoming domestic servants. Um, some of them opened up businesses like laundry, grocery stores, Chinese restaurants, like this one. <laughs> and actually there's still one remaining restaurant um, that comes from that time period, um, Canton Restaurant in San Francisco was a, opened in 1849. Wow. So then I wonder, now understanding the historical context of the piece, knowing a little bit more about the artist and where he was, why do you think he painted this painting at that time? I'm sure he was repulsed by all of the things that were happening to Chinese people because he got to know them as real people and he realized that he needed to show another side of them that the rest of the United States hadn't seen. So I think that's part of the reason why he painted this. And he painted his friends. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, you mentioned to me earlier that he painted quite a few portraits. He was known as a very skilled portrait painter. So it would make sense that he would paint the people that are around him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Are there any other details, thoughts, fun facts you want to share about this piece before we go out today? We haven't talked about the boy. The boy is wearing a red hat. So going back to color, red is very important in the Chinese culture. It represents uh, festivals and, and weddings. I don't know if I mentioned already that brides wore red. And so this may have been Chinese New Year. So that's when the boy gets to wear his finest and, and not the, the drab black colors of everyday life. And also he's getting a treat from the, what I perceive as the businessman. So, oh, yeah, he's holding something in his yeah, hand. Yeah, he's holding up the, the black sesame roll that we were talking about. So it's unusual to see young boys, but it could be that the businessman, businessman went back to China and brought his son back. That's a possibility. Thanks for sharing a little more on him. I've been curious about him. Any last thoughts before we close out today? I just think it's really important that we remember just the hostilities that were occurring at the time and how refreshing it is to see a different depiction of the Chinese at the time. And also remembering that, you know, given the climate of today, we can, we modern citizens, we can do the same as Theodore Warriors and just get to know people, just to recognize their humanity. I love that thought. Thank you very much, Ying Sang, for sharing all of your knowledge and research on this piece. Thanks to everyone at home for tuning in. 
Join us next month for another round of Gallery Bites. We'll be in another gallery with another guest sharing another work of art with you. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Ying Sang. We'll see everyone next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.